All right, everybody, we are live again. Dynasty Mirror Search for Huru. And I have the brother Dave Anderson on with us uh, tonight, this Thursday night. And uh, today we're going to be discussing, well, tonight we're going to be discussing, uh, first off, Dave's book, Brother Anderson's book, Pitch, Close, Upsell, Repeat. We're going to be discussing that. And then also we're going to discuss, uh, you know, I always encourage people, well, black people to, you know, if you're going to go to corporate America route, at least the very least you could do is make it worth your time. And sales uh, is probably one of the most, uh, I would say, enriching for me. It's been enriching. It's been very, uh, uh, it's afforded me uh, a, a nice lifestyle. Um, always out in the field. I don't have to sit at a desk all day. I'm interacting with people. Um, you know, so it's afforded me a, a lifestyle that I think um, a lot of black people want, but at the same time, they're intimidated by sales. Either they've had a bad experience dealing with a car salesman or the guy selling vacuum cleaners door to door. Uh, and they themselves won't get involved in it, and rather, and they rather settle settle for a job working behind a desk, uh, looking at a computer screen all day. So, uh, brother Anderson, thank you again for joining us. Really appreciate it. Hey man, thank you so much hey, for man. having me. So much for having me. Uh, it's always yeah. good to be it's here, man. Good I love you. Always love, you. love talking to you. You always ask great questions that make me have to think and reach for the answers. It's not the typical thing. Like when I do an interview. On like TV or radio, it's always the same few questions. You always come with really, really good questions. So I'm always honored to be here and to share and uh, bring value to your audience. I appreciate it. So already, I'm I'm, I'm so happy that you addressed uh, one of the uh, comments already in the chat room. Goodness, you already addressed it, Dave. You, you addressed it. When you guys buy this book, all your objections to not selling, he, he addresses it. All the excuses you make to not selling are addressed. Early on in the book. So already in the chat room, to me, sales is the worst and a stressful lifestyle. Sales equals poor health, roller coaster lifestyle. Dave, go ahead and uh, go ahead and break it down. I mean, go ahead and, uh, you know, handle that. I, I, I don't know which part of that bullshit I want to address first. <laughs> first of all, life being black is stressful. Okay? <laughs> That's right. one. Number two. Every black person I know is a whore. Let me break that down. <laughs> See, we're all being pimped. So you didn't know that we were all being pimped. And I'm not talking on some, you know, Farrakhan, conscious, Ungawa black power shit. I'm talking straight up and down. We're being pimped, and I'll prove it to you. I've never been to your home, a uh, person in the chat room whose name I do not know. Um, but I guarantee you that your pimp has the same name that my pimp has. And his name is Bill. Right. And Bill wants his money. And Bill is so kind as a pimp. He comes, takes your money, says, thank you very much, and then sends you a card and says, I'll do it again in 30 days. So that's up and down. Getting behind the wheel of a car is stressful. Um, making ends meet is stressful. Not relying on your God-given talents, gifts, and abilities to make things happen kills me. But the truth of the matter is, black people are the greatest salespeople on the face of the planet. Look at it like this. Hip-hop, jazz, funk, New Jack Swing, rock and roll, country, the blues. All that shit came from us. And we had to convince people that what we had was worth listening to. Even when they wanted to discard our bodies and discard our talents, they couldn't help but listen to what we had. And I'm giving you analogies that are simple for you, but the truth of the matter is, just say you're scared and you don't know how to communicate well enough to close a deal. But if you're not a virgin, you've sold. If you've ever gone into the store, if you're black, you notice. Know I don't care where you are in the diaspora. Because I got, I got Jamaican friends. I got African friends. All black mamas are exactly the same. We going in the store. Don't touch shit. Don't ask me for shit. And if you were able to get your black mama to buy you that toy or that yo-yo or that ice cream cone when she said, we're going in the store. I'm not giving you nothing. Don't ask me for shit. Congratulations, you sold. If you've ever gotten a teacher to change a grade that you know you didn't deserve, you sold. You're looking at sales 
like somebody's coming out of a trailer with with a tweed jacket and leather patches on their elbow trying to swindle you. And that's not what sales is. Sales is uh, a, an exchange of goods and services uh, for finances or for some uh, gain that you feel is valuable. That's all sales is. If you've ever had consensual sex, you've sold. Point blank and period. So, yeah, moving on. Yeah, and, and the, another brother in the chat room says, we sell all the time, we interview for a job, try to date, et cetera, which you pretty much cover in your right. You know, because yeah. again, there's just a lot of, of excuses and objections when you, you know, try to, um, I guess, convince people to um, pursue a career in sales. Well, but, let me, before you go any further, let me address that for a minute. Go ahead. I am, um, I'm the type of person Whereas though I offer advice, if you choose not to take it, well, then that's on you. But I will say this. 2010, I was homeless. Mm. March of 2018, I paid off my house. Mm. Do the math. Eight years. Thank you. So <laughs> some of y'all run around here with 30-year mortgages and can barely make that payment. So tell me again about sales. And then he said it's stressful and poor health. I mean, I think I look all right, you know. Stressful. You know, I'm, you know, when I take my shirt off and look in the mirror, Pauls, you know, I look, uh, you know, I look pretty good. Hey, let me tell you something. When I take my shirt off and look in the mirror, I'm happy with what I see. Here's uh -huh. the truth. Here's the truth. And there have been studies that, that will back me up on this. It's not whether you smoke or drink. It's not whether you're morbidly obese. It's your ability and your consistency when it comes to interacting with people. How many people do salespeople interact with on a regular basis that chooses the uh, the quality of your life? And that's the thing, like, it's not, if you're not emotionally stable to deal with the fact that there are going to be times when things are going to be tight, what if, in fact, you have just your bills and you got enough just to, like, maybe do a little bit something else, but your water main breaks? then you you've got a problem right you know there's like shit happens don't just put it on oh if i have this salary see you, you, you what that equates to me is the 2018 version of why is i was gonna leave this plantation mass a good white folk he just wants us to work harder and pick his cotton but i was like it when he let me make him his mint julep because I don't know what's out there, but I was going to stay on the plantation while you get on from around here talking that escape talk. Like, I mean, come on, man. Like, you're never going to be in a position. Like, even if you become the CEO of the company, you'll never be the owner. You're always going to be asking another person, be they a man or a woman, for them to judge you based on how you feel about you. Ain't nobody ever going to do that. So you're always going to be asking somebody else for permission, asking somebody else to give you a 3% cost of living increase, whatever the hell that is. Right. Working 50, hour of, working 50 uh, weeks out of the year for two weeks if they're not blocked off or blacked out so that you can have a vacation with your family. Coming home after you know spending a good 10 hours a day between commuting and actually working away from your family just to get home to your family and be too tired to do anything, let alone unbuckle your belt. So, again, tell me about unhealthy. All right. So another objection that I hear in regards to sales, Dinus, you know, I have my office job, you know, I'm making 40K a year. <laughs> uh, I just, I don't want to take a risk uh, with the sales job where it's 100% commission. Uh, you know, because all these sales jobs, you know, the majority of them that I've been contacted by or I'm interested in are 100% commission. Uh, what would be your, um, I guess, your rebuttal to that? I'm so sorry that your mama didn't give you any self-esteem. Period. Mm -hmm. um, to put that another way. If you, I, I'll never forget. I remember uh, Nutrisystem hired me to be a consultant. And I came in. And they paid me a salary. It was a nice salary, 80, 90 grand, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was cool. And then I started realizing that there were holes in the boat, little things that I could do. And I sat down with the CEO, the head of PR, uh, the marketing team, and their digital team. And I said, get rid of this, change that, 
you're doing a horrible job on YouTube. Fix this, fix that, fix this. And they're like, oh, that's really good. But yet and still, I didn't get any extra money for that. Right. So I gave away intellectual property under the call uh, under the clause of a work for hire because I had a salary. Your salary's capped. I'll make 40 grand in a month and not like not worry about it. Like you've got to put yourself in position, but see, your mind has to be right. You have to put yourself in a position to say, what I have inside of me is great enough that people will buy it. But because you don't have the self-esteem and you've been told to climb your little corporate ladder and, and, and get your little bonuses and be happy with Taco Tuesday, you can't, you know, get past that. So let me ask you something. When you get downsized, that job gets sold to China, you get fired. Where's hmm. your stability then? Because while you're packing up that cubicle in a nice little brown box and the people that you said hello to turn their heads and look the other way and the security guard who you've said hey to a million and one times walks you out solemnly and doesn't even give you a look as they kick your ass cere- unceremoniously out the door, um, what you going to do then? Apply for another job and talk about how cushy and safe it is? Man, please. Give me a real question, please. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's get into the book. What uh, what motivated you to to write the book? Um, what motivated me to write "Pitch Close Up, So Repeat"? Mm-hmm. Um, two things. First, when I retired from radio, um, it was one of those things where I needed to do something else, and I had spent so much time and effort closing business for radio salespeople, and they couldn't figure out how I was able to get in there, get a bigger contract put things on the table, you know, make money for them that I got sick of people asking me what my process was. And so I wound up taking a six year journey and I sold everything from diet plans to gutters to uh, cable, um, barbecue grills. I I sold any and everything, home security systems. I was selling home security so well. I worked for Honeywell Mm -hmm. and then ADT bought out my contract from Honeywell because I was removing too many of their systems. So they hired wow. me. And so I took everything because no matter what company you put me in, I was either going to be number one or number two if you gave me enough time. And people were like, how are you doing this? And what are you doing? And so instead of me having to tell people, oh, go do this. These are the clothes I use. This is what you do when you're in this type of neighborhood. This is how you prospect. This is how you cold call. This is what happened to me a funny time this time. I just put it all in the book so I don't have to keep repeating myself. The second thing was I was watching wrestling because I think a lot of times we become machines in business and we don't take time to humanize ourselves and do things that um, allow for escapism and fun. And when I was a kid, I loved professional wrestling. I wrestled professionally when I was in my 20s. Um, And so I was like, you know, you need to get back into reading comic books and watching wrestling and, and just, you know, taking some time to just get all that shit out your head. And so I'm watching wrestling one day and Paul Heyman, um, who's a Philadelphia staple, was on the TV with Brock Lesnar, and he was talking about eat, sleep, conquer, repeat. And I was like, hmm. I'm like, that's kind of what I do. But I pitch, close, upsell, repeat. And I got up out of my bed, I turned the TV off, and I got to type it. Hmm. And there you have it. Now, how how would your book help inspire someone who's on the fence about sales, but, you know, like, ah, I don't know if I want to sell or, you know, I'm on the fence. How would your book, how would Pitch, Close, Upsell, Repeat inspire them to to want to go ahead and consider a career in sales? I would say that no matter what you do, it sales. Mm-hmm. You know, even if you don't become a salesperson, mm-hmm. you're selling yourself. There are people who have businesses um, and they're not in the sales business per se. Like, I've got clients who... Um, they, like I have a client right now, when I started with her, she had, uh, two locations that she went and got a third. She does, she's an esthetician. So she does like lashes and eyebrows and things of that nature. You know, she's up to four locations and she's doing her annual salary, um, that she, that she pays out in payroll is between 450 and half a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. That's what she pays out to her, 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 her staff. So she's making incredible money. I have another client who, um, 
you know, had a boutique that was floundering online. Now she has the number one black owned plus size boutique in the world. And she's making money because technique is what you need. You need to understand how to harness your charm. You need to know how to package your skills. You need to know how to speak and interact with people. You need to learn how to sympathize and empathize, when to be aggressive and when to love on people. You need to know uh, when someone's bullshitting and tire kicking or when somebody's right for the ceiling, you need to strike while the iron's hot. I put all of that in that book and I did it in less than 100 pages. Which is a good thing. Yeah, because I'm not here. Like, there are people like, well, the book is so short. I'm sorry. I'm not Dickens, bitch. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm here to give you information. Now, other people will blow smoke up your ass. I wanted you to be able to read this book in a couple of hours and then go back and highlight and make references and, and use what works for you. I, I didn't write this book for me. I wrote it for people who didn't understand what a sales process looked like and how freeing it could be. The fact that my mom is retired, the fact that, you know, my brother works only by choice, you know, that my wife does not have to work, that my daughter doesn't have to worry about where her tuition's coming from, that's freedom. And I didn't want to be the only person giving people um, out here having this freedom when there are other people who needed to know how to access that in themselves with what they're currently doing. So I think it will inspire you to look at how you're running your business or look at what you're doing at your job and realize that I have something that I can turn into uh, a business and make money on. Let's see what questions we have in the chat room. Now, here, here's the interesting question. Um, can a sales career be hereditary? I said no, unless you own the company. Mm. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Can you pass it on? Yes. Um, my parents, excellent salespeople, you know, and I talk about both my parents in, in the book, almost did. in a rich dad, poor dad style. You know, my father was instinctually smart. You know, my father had a corner store in the hood, um, and he had his brothers involved. He sent his one brother to, uh, to, um, culinary school so that he could buy the top of the building and turn that into a bar and catering hall. Um, my dad also because this is the 80s. My dad also mm -hmm. took um, his money and bought two very popular video game, um, arcade games, and put them in the shop, and then would fill them with quarters every day. And I'm like, Dad, why did you spend so much money on these games? And he was like, all these kids around here can't get to the mall. They can't afford Nintendos or Ataris or, or Segas, but they can come in here and play these games. And you know what they're going to say? Mom, I'm going to go to the store to play video games. Okay, well, buy me a loaf of bread and a pack of cigarettes. So my father understood the importance of baiting your audience and making sure that even though you're targeting one audience, you're really targeting another. You know, my mother, on the other hand, was all about um, experiential sales. My mother was creating, um, you know how like you go into a salon now and you'll see um, couches and women lounging and mimosas on Sunday, and, right. um, you know, uh, manicures and pedicures while you wait. My mom was doing that shit in the eighties. She had she had a uh, she had a salon called Girlfriends, and she, that was after she was running the largest uh, downtown salon in John Wanamaker's in uh in in downtown Philadelphia. So my parents had different ways that they operated, but they were about creating a, a situation that made people so comfortable they were willing to part with their hard earned money without thinking about it. So those gifts were passed down to me. And I wasn't even aware of it at the time. I was just like, okay. So, yeah, it's hereditary. Now, can you pass down a job to your kids? No. But you can pass down the skills. Mm. Mm. And, guys, so, guys, this should be mandatory mandatory reading with you and your family. So, when you guys buy the book, make sure you buy the book, okay, and read this with your kids so you can start getting them ready now. Now, let's, let's talk about being consistent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know sometimes uh, we can, some of us aren't as consistent and persistent like we need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 would you, what, what would you say about that as far as making sure you're ensuring that you're consistent? Uh, you know, because consistency is the key to success and making sure you're persistent as well. Uh, and, and not only just mastering your craft, but, you know, whatever, um, I would say, adversity you face. You know, to keep keep it going. 
I know, I know a lot of people say the reason why they don't want to do sales is because they can't handle rejection. They don't like rejection. Uh, well, what's your, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? I, I go back to, uh, and I'm going to address your consistency thing second, but I'm going to go back to the first, uh, the, the last thing you said, uh, which was they can't handle rejection. Is your ego that fragile that a note from the stranger stops you from getting the money? But y'all all on the internet talking about how bad you want to secure the bag. Right. Uh, that, 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 that's called hypocrisy, people. Um, nobody who is not feeding you, clothing you, or fucking you should have that much power over you that them telling you <laughs> no stops you from doing what it is that you need to do. And even then, you know, you've got to have a thicker skin. No, don't bother me. Okay, you said no. Listen, there have been people who made millions of dollars off of no. There you go telling me no again. He sweat. There you go. Ah, man. Yeah. <laughs> For that New Jack City soundtrack. Sheet, all day. You know, you can't you can't be so upset that somebody told you no. You know, like and like <laughs> Like every once in a while, like companies will hire me to come and, and go undercover and watch what's happening on the sales floor or watch what's happening in a particular store to see how the things are set up or um, just spend a day doing sales so they can show their, 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 their staff how to do things right. Not saying that I'm perfect, but for some reason, people like how I sell. Um, and do you have any idea how many times I've pitched something? in a day that I know is a great product that I know people will need or a great service that I know people need and they'll walk right past you like they don't even see you like you missed their cellophane I ain't hurt you want to know why because none of them who ignored me were my wife they weren't my daughters they didn't change the Egyptian cotton sheets on my bed right. you know <laughs> they didn't all of a sudden make me have an additional two three mortgage payments on my already paid off house Nothing changed. I was still Dave Anderson, even though they ignored me and played me like my name was Stanley. So mm. that's that's one. Now let's talk about consistency. Yes. We're dealing with the NBA finals right now. Mm -hmm. And there's always this talk about LeBron and and and, and Jordan. Right. Um I met Michael Jordan, he's an asshole. I've met LeBron James, he's the nicest person I've ever met. Having said that. The one thing that both of those individuals have in common, practice. Right. Over and over and over again. You've got to develop a certain muscle memory. The reason that I don't like it when people um, send me a list of questions, I don't want your list of questions. I just want you to ask me. If you know your subject matter, you ought to be able to answer the question. My whole thing is, I know how hard it is to be consistent. So I developed a formula and I talk about this with my, with my students and with my coaching clients. Um, one thing that you need to do is part of what I call the bully method. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, I teach people to do is called time blocking. This is what the average entrepreneur does. The average entrepreneur will get up, they'll shower, they'll, they'll, they'll brush their teeth, you know, uh, put on their clothes and then they'll start to get to work and they'll, uh, work on social media for a little bit. They may be writing their book. Uh, they may do a few sales calls. They may follow up, um, you know, on some emails. They may uh, check uh, check the fax machine if they're archaic. Um, they might be on their phone looking for prospects or they'll be on LinkedIn for a while. Those are a lot of different activities. I don't do that. Sundays, I will do YouTube. Mondays, I'll focus on writing. Tuesdays, I'll focus on podcasts. Wednesdays, I'll focus on um, whatever book I'm working on at the time. Like, I don't vary from that one. I get that one task done for the day, and I'll work out, you know, if, if it's, you know, between six and eight hours for that for the week, then that means if I'm doing between six and eight hours, then I'm somewhere around seven, which means that I've got seven days of whatever that is in the can. That way you're not stressing yourself out and you look up, oh, there's not enough time. Oh, I forgot to pick Billy up from soccer practice. That's how you remain consistent. You block your time and you work on one thing, one day. One thing, one day, period. Makes life a lot easier. 
Uh, Jocelyn in the chat room says technology is replacing sales. I, and, I, and I disagree because I, I see more sales jobs. I mean, I'm, I'm getting hit up by headhunters every day. Uh, what, so what, what are your thoughts on technology one day replacing salespeople? I don't see how that's going to happen. Because unless they're going to program the robot, to answer the three major questions that every human being asked before a sale is ever made, it ain't happening. Now, my my wife's grandmother um, worked at Bell Telephone, and mm -hmm. she started off as a switchboard operator. And back in those days, when you were a switchboard operator, you had these little plugs, and they would go, you would connect one to the other, and it would create a loop. And that's how you would connect lines to each other. As you know, um, there was a time when you had to have a license to be an elevator operator like my great uncle. Mm -hmm. And he was the elevator operator in a very nice hotel in downtown Philadelphia. So times can and do change. So my great uncle went to school, learned some other skills and became uh, became the maitre d' of the restaurant at the uh, at the um, hotel. My uh, grandmother in law wound up being a vice president at Bell Telephone, you know, before things got to where they got to. You understand what I'm saying? Right. That's different. Because you know what? Whether they were operating the phones or whether they were helping people in the elevator or whether they were taking reservations, my relatives um, understood that butts still had to be in seats. And the butt and seat part, the building rapport part, the three questions, I know people are like, well, what are the three questions? Who are you? What do you have? And why should I care? Right. So if you can't answer those, if a robot can't, um, can't answer those questions in a way that's convincing, that's different. Now, when it comes to walk-up business, absolutely. And I think what your, what, what your chat room person is trying to get at is if you go to McDonald's, they're going to be, they're, they're a kiosk now in right. a lot of McDonald's. But so you got to understand why that is. That's because a lot of you lazy bastards are afraid to do something other than menial jobs. Here's what I mean. Um, there's a bunch of people who are fighting for their right to make a decent minimum wage. Here's what you miss. If you raise the minimum wage, technology and the free market is always going to find a way to respond 10 times as hard and 10 times as fast. So if you get to 15 or $17 an hour for flipping fucking burgers, then guess what? They're going to take two people. They're going to have one to uh, flip the burgers and one to work the drive through. Everything else will happen on the, everything else will happen on the damn kiosk. And the 20 other people who were working will no longer be making any damn thing because they'll be replaced. Right. That's different from an actual salesperson going through a pitch, going through the process of building rapport, um, pinning an item or a service on someone, uh, assessing the situation, knowing when to upsell, when not to upsell. Like There's so many nuances to human behavior that a salesperson, a great salesperson, uh, understands that that can't necessarily be replaced in this lifetime. But yeah, kiosk, absolutely. For, for McDonald's and shit like that, yeah. Not not for what we do. Yeah, Jocelyn says that Alexa, Siri, Polly, and other AI programs will start to push ads to you based upon what they hear in your house. So yeah. she thinks we're underestimating uh, AI. In I'm not underestimating to AI at all. AI has a different function. You're talking to somebody who is, you know, the, the forefather of podcasting. You're talking to somebody who's created um, HitMeOnHit.com. You're talking about somebody who improved the model that you now know as iHeartRadio, the app. So mm -hmm. you can't, you know, you can't give me the technology talk as if I haven't done this already. Um, the thing about voice and the thing about um, AI, and, and me and Gary V were having this conversation in November. Um, it's here. You can't ignore it. It's going to simplify things. If you are Susie the checkout girl at Whole Foods, it sucks to be you. Right. If you are Jimmy the stock boy, you, you're, you're, you're going to have a job because they're going to need somebody to stock that shit. But if you're looking to be the person who has to show people where shit is, no, there's going to be an app for that. 
You know, um, I personally am a big fan of my time. Like my time is second only to my wife and my mother mm -hmm. and my kids because I value my time so much. I don't do menial shit like grocery shop for what I can do that on the computer and have them deliver that shit to me. That part is cool. Or, or Hey Siri, go get my, you know, go, go order. Oh, God damn it. Siri, don't actually do it. Siri on my iPad is about to go off. God damn it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, buying toothpaste and that kind of shit. Like for me, yeah, that's different. I'm not underestimating that, but I'm putting it in its proper context. And that's what people are missing out on. The menial shit that doesn't matter, yeah. Siri ain't gonna sell no Siri's not gonna sell you on um, you know, a three bedroom condo. Like Facts. she's not gonna do that. Facts. Siri's not gonna sell you on you know the deluxe vacation package. Siri ain't gonna do that. Because you have to they have to have somebody who's able to paint the picture for you there. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that that's the part that, that you got to look at. So it's not just, oh, well, Siri and Alexa and, you know, Jim Bob and Bobo, you know, are, are, are going to take over. Like, this ain't the Matrix. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, 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 the robots aren't going to come in black in the sky. Like, stop. We're good. Right. <laughs> what, what about the uh, I'm not a people person? Uh, you know, I don't want to get involved in sales because I'm not a people person. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? That comment I hate excuse. people. Next question. <laughs> no, like if you like if you, like people who know me, uh -huh. people who know me, like and, and people think that it's a marketing thing, Dynasty. I'm be honest with you, it's not. It's part of that, but it's not that. Right. When I'm out, like I don't like if, if when I'm in Philly. Um, let's see. In 2017, I'll give you an example. 2017, I made two public appearances. One uh, was, oh, no, that's not two. I made three. One was on a radio show. Another one was on a TV show. And the third one was BullyCon, which is my annual live event. And that's it. You don't see me. I don't do a whole lot of community shit. I don't, like, I do it, but I don't do it out. I don't do it like I got people for that. I don't right. like people that much. But my mouth game is strong. Right. So I don't have to like you to close you. I don't have to be a people person to get to, to realize you got my kids tuition in your pocket. Right. And I need it. So I'm going to give you these goods and these services and you're going to run that tuition money. That does not require me getting to know you, getting to know all about you. No, it doesn't. It requires that I build up enough rapport to make you feel comfortable in what it is that you're doing and make you feel like I care about what you're going to feel like once you get my product or service. It does not require me to rub your, you know, rub your back and, and, and you know, and tip your butt cheeks. It doesn't require that. And that's where you get it messed up. You know, you know who the best salespeople I know are? Aside who? from children? Who? Strippers. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Because strippers and strippers and prostitutes give people what are called the girlfriend experience. They make mm. you feel like they care to the point where you actually think you're gonna go in that same pay room and smash something. Right. For free. For the free. <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. Right. But you still believe that you're gonna be the you gonna be the one. The one. You sound like a girl trying to change a thug. So you sound like a dude trying to take a hoe and make her a house right. Stop that. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's what it is. I know, like, I'm genuine in everything that I do, and I do care that you feel good about what it is that you're buying, but if you don't buy it, it ain't life or death for me. And that's the difference. You, you're, I don't come at sales from an emotional place. I come from a passionate place and a means to an end. That's it. You don't have to love it. You just have to love and believe in what it is that you're selling. And that it will make somebody's life better. Period. What about um? Now, now you mentioned um, you're not a people person, but you will build enough rapport mm -hmm. to get to know the person and ensure that you get um, uh, you know, get that commission so you could pay your daughter's uh, tuition. What mm -hmm. like what would be enough rapport? Because I'm very big on building rapport in a, in a sales cycle. Okay. Um. 
Good like, what's enough to ensure that at least the person on the other side that you're selling to, I guess, thinks that you're actually interested in them? I am interested in them. In that okay. moment, they're, they're, they are all that matters to me. You know, I need to be clear on that. I love my people. And if I'm selling something, I'm selling something because I believe in it. And enough rapport is enough for you to stop having the I'm not going to give pay a lot for this muffler stance. Enough is enough rapport where I can get you to smile, get you to talk about, you know, your experiences, um, what's happened before, you know, because you won't give me a sob story. You know, you're going to tell me how this hasn't happened. Like every time I do it, uh, every time I and this is this is something that I take very seriously. And this isn't a sales thing. This is my business. And when it comes to like when I'm coaching black entrepreneurs, I take it very seriously because I take the money that you make for your family extremely serious. I take the fact that you're trying to boost the black economy very seriously. I take the fact that you don't want to be beholden to a job living um, from check to check, running from pillar to post. Um, going into a gig that you don't necessarily love because you'll never be the owner and you got to ask somebody else's permission to go to your kid's soccer game or school play. I take that very seriously. And so when I'm choosing clients or I'm doing discovery calls and we're talking about whether or not it's a good fit, I care immensely about that. And I'm passionate about that. Having said that, I'm not your mama either. So I don't want you to um think that I'm gonna break my neck to convince you to invest in you. You know, and for me, I make sure that they know that at that moment it doesn't matter what's happening. Unless my wife is calling with the house is on fire, which likely it wouldn't be because I'm usually doing shit from my house. Um you're all that matters at that time. You know, I was doing a consult this morning and a young lady was telling me she um she hates her job. Um, her kid is in the school district. She had to pull the kid out of school because the teachers were calling the cops on the kid. The wow. kid is seven. Seven-year-old boy in, in, in Dallas, Texas, in the suburb of Dallas, Texas. And, you know, the teachers are calling the cops on him. Like, you know what that does to a little boy's psyche? But if she had the time to homeschool him, if she could grow her business, then she would need that sucky-ass job and she wouldn't have to drop her little baby boy off out of France. She can get a K-12 curriculum, partner with an online school, and then still have the rest of the day to grow and build her business while putting the right systems in place in order to do so. So, I take that real serious and I make sure that they understand that I'm here for them, I'm here to support them, and I want them to win. Sometimes more than they want it for themselves, which can be problematic. You either rise to the occasion or I cut you loose. So I think it's enough report for them to come to the realization that they need whatever the product or service is in order to get the desired result that they say that they want, which is why listening is so important. All right, let's see what else we have here in the chat room. Um, once again, everybody, we have Brother Dave Anderson on, and we're just discussing sales in his book, Pitch, Close, Upsell, Repeat. So, guys, please go purchase the book. I'll put the link to it. Um, the, the Amazon is is only offered on Amazon. I bought mine off of Amazon. Is it offered anywhere else? Um, uh, yeah, Anderson, I mean, you, the book. Yeah, yeah, you can you can get it on Amazon. Um, I also for a lot of my courses, it, it's 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 uh, it's also available. There is um an ebook version that you can get. Um, I also have an um autograph version you can get at um ibrainuniversity.com forward slash store. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can get it pretty much anywhere and everywhere, but yeah, not just Amazon, even though I like Amazon cause that keeps my rankings popping, you know, and the book sold a lot, so I can't really complain. So thank you to everybody who bought the book. And are, is there any other books you're working on that, that are, that you've released that I overlooked? Wow. Um, I have a book called common sense ain't common. Okay. Um, is that on Amazon? I, oh yeah. It's on Amazon. Um, Les Brown did the forward for that book. It's a great book. Um, basically that's the book that, that got my mindset. Um, I wrote that book while I was homeless. Okay. Wow. Um, 
and I was living. If, in my if, you, if you don't mind me asking, Dave, and you yeah. can, you can answer it after you finish. How did you get to that point where you were homeless? Like, what happened? If you don't, and I'm yeah. sorry, I just. Oh, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. So, um, long story very short. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a series of an, of unfortunate events based upon the consequences of bad choices that I made. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I chose, uh, I chose the wrong woman. Big mistake. Um, I chose to, uh, build a show around someone who didn't want what I wanted for him. Um, and when that led to me leaving that situation, Everybody in radio, it got to a point where in radio, you ask anybody who Radio Tupac is, they'll say Dave Anderson. Because it was like, I'd get fired or shot, and then I'd be back the next day. Like, first off, fuck you, click, and get bit. You know what I mean? Like, it, it was just that type of party. Like, I would go across the street the next day. It was it was nothing for me to get another job. Hang on. It was nothing for me to get another job. And everybody thought that somebody else had already hired me, so nobody really worried about me. I make too much money for unemployment. So that was out. And then my savings dwindled up. And then, you know, cars got repossessed and, you know, apartments and divorces and uh, shit happens. But, uh, you know, people don't people don't know your name no more. People don't call you. Right. That kind of stuff. But all of that was my fault. And it was my fault because I made really, really bad choices based upon the evidence that I had in front of me at the time. And based upon thinking that people thought like I did or, you know, the greatest mistake that a lot of people make is thinking that you can't want something more for somebody more than they want it for themselves, mm. you know, and um, I'll give you an example. Ricky Smiley wanted to do a sitcom. I wanted to do a reality show. I left. Ricky did the sitcom. It tanked. He brought up the reality show. Number one show on TV one. So. You know, it's those kinds of things that, you know, happen when people can't see the vision right away and they got to go through a few ass whippings. So, you know, I'm not immune to that, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's what wound up happening. So you, you figure months and months and months, there's no money coming in. So savings dwindle. And if they're not replenished and bills are still where they are, 2,500 square foot apartment, uh, two cars, um, you know, a driver you know, all that kind of shit. And even if you're scaling down, you still have to, like, I'm in the middle of a lease. I can't break the lease. You know, so guess what winds up happening? Oh, and then, oh, divorce. So anybody, you know, is anywhere between two weeks and nine months from delivering pizzas or being homeless. And so I wound up washing up at a gas station sink at 360 and Carrier in Arlington, Texas. So that's what happened. And, and how were you able to bounce back the way you did? Like, what was it like? Bro, huh, it's a lot of things. I was depressed. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was embarrassed. I was hurt. Like, stuff like that don't happen to me. But it happened to me. Right. You know, I'm sure AIDS or HIV didn't happen to Magic Johnson, but it happened to him. You know, um, things happen. And it doesn't matter how talented you are or how skilled you are you got to get it figured out. And I knew for me that I didn't like feeling like that. So I went and I worked at a credit card uh, processing place, um, setting appointments for other salespeople. And I got really good at that. I saved up enough money to get home. And I lived with my brother uh, in his uh, garage, which he converted into a toy room for his, uh, for his kids, my niece and my nephew. And so um, I had a TV deal. I got a TV deal uh, while all this was going on. And, you know, the TV deal was cool, but it didn't pan out the way that I wanted it to. And then one day I just heard this voice in my head said, you need to write something. And so I went to the dollar store. I went and got um, some composition books and some pens, and I just started writing. And, you know, like TV show was go to whole nine. Um, and I walked away from the deal. Like, and I mean, I had hired people like I had, Roy Wood Jr. from The Daily Show, he was my head writer. Like, we were doing skits, and, like, it was all, like, I mean, I got stuff archived somewhere. But I let it go because it wasn't what I was supposed to do. And I wrote Common Sense Ain't Common while in my brother's garage. 
you know, and mm-hmm. that book sold a lot. And I also at this time the BET Awards was happening. This is like right after Michael Jackson died, mm-hmm. and um, I I went to Facebook and I wrote a, a blog. This is before Facebook Live or any of that fly shit, and before Zucks got smart with the algorithms. So I write this thing called the Top Ten Reasons the BET Awards Made Me Want to Vomit. And then I wake up the next morning, and you know I got people calling and texting me. I ain't paying no attention, whatever. I wake up the next morning, people are like, "Yo, you, you're in the LA Times," and I'm like. The fuck you mean? So I go to the LA Times website and showing up there, you know, they're saying this this one blogger said that the BET Awards was the swine flu of award shows. That was <laughs> that was funny in 09 because swine flu was a big deal then. Right. See how quickly we jump on and off of you know media uh health scares. So you know that got people looking at me differently. And then um I got on you know I started a uh, a podcast on blog talk radio. And I still had a lot of friends in the industry. So I had Maxwell and Queen Latifah and Talib Kweli and all these different folks being guests on my show. And so my show was just skyrocketing because most people weren't able to get that type of guest. And um, from there, um, I started to deal with iHeart and that's how I got out of homelessness. That's people, people need to hear that. Cause I think sometimes man, a lot of people uh, especially public figures, man, they're not uh, transparent. Uh, yeah. So people need to, you know, speak on the adversity. And uh, so we have examples of how people, you know, made it through. And so we, uh, we appreciate that. Uh, the, the, the name of your show, um, Brother Anderson, mm-hmm. uh, in the red is asking, I'll put it in the, uh, the, the chat room, the business bully show. Yep. So it's in the chat room in the red. So you could click on it. Mm-hmm. Um, in the chat room. Yeah. Uh, in the red, it's in the chat room. So go ahead and click on that and make sure you check it out. Also, um, buy the book, everybody. Go to Amazon, buy the book. Uh, please support Brother Anderson. I really appreciate him uh, coming on. Uh, do we have any more questions in the chat room for, uh, for, for Brother David Anderson? Any more questions? Shout out to Doug. Doug is the best moderator on the planet. I don't what think up, Doug, Doug? sleeps. I don't think Doug sleeps. I don't know what Doug does, but he 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 will he moderates for about 30 different people. Damn. <laughs> Doug needs to sell that as a service. A- exactly. You know, but Ken wants to know, do you train people um to be sales? Do you train sales? Do you sell? Do you train people to be to get involved in sales, or do you train salespeople? Absolutely, I train salespeople every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, you can uh, set up a discovery call with me, mm-hmm. um, bit.ly forward slash bully call, or you can just email me directly, Dave at businessbullyshow.com. Matter of fact, just shoot me an email. Tell me you're on, uh, you were listening or watching Dinah's show, um, Dave at businessbullyshow.com. And I'm I'm definitely happy to chop it up with you. See what uh, you know, see what's necessary, see what we can do. Um, because I'm all about trying to help people get to the next level. Okay, absolutely. Uh, brother Anderson, brother Anderson, is there anything else you like you would like to share in uh, closing before we uh, before we check out? Yeah. Um. Above all else, we live in a time where things are happening that we don't necessarily recognize, and. In 2014, 2015, uh, I was, I was again, I was at Nutrisystem System at this point, and I remember uh, people kept talking about this show. Oh, you got to see this show. It's the most amazing thing in the world, and I, I know you heard of it, but, you know, you just got to watch it. And I was like, okay, I'll watch it. So one weekend, me and my wife broke down, and we started watching Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. And the first thing I remember is they kept saying, winter is coming. Winter is coming. And the person who says a guy named Ned Stark. Now, I'm not trying to do any spoiler alerts here, but spoiler alert, if you've never seen mm-hmm. Game of Thrones, Go Ned on. Stark dies. <laughs> he, he dies in like the first episode, if not the second, if I'm not mistaken. And winter don't come until like this past season. But when winter comes, it's a bitch. So I'm trying to tell black people, winter is coming. In 20 years, it's going to be as weird to see a black person rapping as it is to see a black person playing rock and roll is now. 
they keep light skinning and and whitewashing and racially ambiguous right. our um our music. And well, Vicky. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, look, oh, little Dicky. Oh, what's up, man? You know, man. Oh, well, Chris <laughs> Brown wrote it, so it's okay. No, it's not. <laughs> Fuck little Dicky too. Fuck Drake. Y'all can make up excuses for that damn uh that that damn Sambo uh, blackface. I've been I've been in the oh, Drake. Yeah. I've been in the business. I've been in the entertainment business since I was nine years old. I'm forty. I have never ever done blackface, ever. Mm -hmm. I've been on reality shows. I've been on CNN. I've been on Bravo. I've been on MTV. I've been on VH1 behind the music without a record deal. And you're trying to tell me that I was doing this because it. Was, and then like, I thought you was all hip hop. You was hip hop when you was giving it to Meek Mill. But now right. that, that push is giving it to you, you ain't hip hop no more. You and your writing team can't come up with anything, so you you, you send out a press memo? Okay. <laughs> but that's what happens. Now you got people like um, Cardi B being pitted against Nicki Minaj. Right. You know, because Nicki's a little bit darker. And then you got people like uh, oh Azalea Banks, you know, being called crazy and also other stuff. And I'm like, okay, she crazy. But when she told y'all that a white man spit on her and threw her out of a hotel room unceremoniously and nobody defended her. Y'all all called her a liar until you found out it was true and y'all still ain't apologize to that sister. You know, you got to understand that after a while they're going to wash you out and they keep telling you these facts. Um, you know, in 50 years, you know, there there won't there there won't be any more white people or black people. Everybody will just be brown. <laughs> Everybody will be a nice shade of tan. All right. Stop, the man. Like, pay attention. America. You need to start putting yourself in a position to thrive and win, and you're not going to do that under their thumb. You have to create your own economy. You've got to entrench yourself. And until such time as you realize that the best way to do that is by controlling your environment, controlling your financial uh, resources, and controlling your community, and control the messages that your children receive, you're going to be in a world of trouble. And so that's why I encourage people to, you know, listen to programs like what Dynast is doing, what I'm doing, you know, real folks, not folks out here acting like they care about black people, but secretly work for Chinese people. Not people who are just taking your money and putting it in their perms. Not, <laughs> not people who have been building a school for the past eight years, but ain't seen a brick or, 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 or some cement. You know what I'm saying? Like people who are really, you know, about black people doing big things and, and, and being what we are. We don't need them. And I'll never forget this. You know, I, I had this last thing I'll say and I'll leave you alone. Go ahead. Take your time. Take your time. I was frustrated one day. Mm -hmm. And so I called David Banner and I was like, Banner, why is it it's so easy for me to walk in a room and say this, 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 that, you know, and white folks will just stroke me out of check. And he was like, he said, I'm going to tell you what I told people who asked me to sing, you know, who, um, you know, get on me about, you know, getting this John Williams money. John Williams being a famous composer because David Banner does a lot of scoring that people doesn't realize that he that he does for movies and things of that nature. And he said, if I had you, I wouldn't need them. And to take that a step further, if you showed up and built your business and got the right coaching and got the right tools and understood the right processes and your business was thriving, we would be self-contained. We would control our own images. We would control our own um, vehicles. We would control our own music and our own destinies, but we don't. We got people who do not look like us telling you what black culture is and y'all sitting up here and adapting it as if it's real. Right. Six people. Six people own all the media and they're all Jewish. None of them are black. But y'all keep buying this. People talking about, oh, well, you know, the black lady at ABC canceled Roseanne. No, she didn't. Bob Iger canceled Roseanne. Mm -hmm. And he told her to put out, the, he told her to put out the memo, but he called Valerie Jarrett and said, listen, I'm canceling Roseanne. Get ready. It's, it's going, it's going to be a shitstorm, but I'm going to cancel Roseanne because we don't tolerate that around here. Bob Iger made that call. Right. Because the black woman that you're praising right now is the same black woman who greenlit Roseanne after one episode. Uh, ordered a second season, and it's the same black woman who said, "You know what? That Colin Kaepernick episode of uh, Blackish, uh, we're we're going to shelve that." Yep. So, pay attention to what's happening, 
and not only pay attention to it, but circle your wagons around creating a black economy for mm. you and your family so that you can be an active participant, not someone who just bitches and complains on the internet. And I'm done. Brother Anderson, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and sorry about the confusion in regards to um, the schedule, but thank you so much for joining us. We really, uh, really appreciate it. Man, I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me, man. And again, no problem. And, and guys, make sure. Me. Anytime, brother. Make sure you guys support Brother Anderson. Go and buy his book, okay? Make sure you go to the businessbullyshow.com. Make sure you go to amazon.com and buy Pitch, Close, Upsell, Repeat. Very easy read. Lots of value. Um, please go support Brother Anderson. Uh, also, make sure you go to dinosamir.com, search for huru.com, go to Africa personify.africa. Also, go to search for who on Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, real quick, real quick, um, Brother Anderson, uh, tell tell the um, everyone in the uh, in the chat room about Black Boys Win. All right, so I went out to try and uh, find something to donate to. Mm -hmm. And that that was focused on on black boys, very similar to my friend Beverly Bonds, um, Black Girls Rock. I wanted to have something that was going to be uplifting that was strictly targeted for black boys. So uh, Barack Obama had a program called My Brother's Keeper, which sounds like it's for black boys, but it's for black and other. Right. You know, Usher has a program that sounds like it's for black boys, but it's for everybody. Right. I wanted something because black boys have a very unique experience. You know, even my wife, who is black, doesn't fully can understand but can't fully relate to what it means to be stopped, detained, handcuffed, and being told that you fit the description. You know, or you know, black girls are told, and I'm not saying it's it's a cakewalk for black girls. That's not my that's not my judge, but I do look at the facts. If you look at the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurs in the country, it's black women. Right. And the reason that it is is because there, there's something that you put in your daughters that you don't put in your sons. As a man who has two daughters, you know, I tell my girls that they can do whatever they want. I got friends. I've got godsons. I've got nephews. And you know what they're told? Get a haircut, pull your pants up. You know? Uh, which is why I couldn't, uh, you know, I looked at Steve Harvey's situation. I didn't like it because I don't think push-ups and being yelled at or going to a ranch for a weekend is going to impact a young man. Telling him that his that his locks or his mohawk needs to be cut off in order to be successful or that he has to wear a suit in order to be successful is exactly why I have a mohawk and I don't wear a suit. Mm. You know, I've closed million-dollar deals with this mohawk. So you can miss me with that bullshit that 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 show me your papers, show me your teeth, you know, slave buck auction block mentality is why black folks aren't getting anywhere. And when it comes to Steve Perry, phenomenal educator, but he's still educating in a system that's set up by white supremacy that only teaches the things that white supremacy feels like black people need to know. And that's not enough. Telling me how many stars in Orion's belt is not going to put any uh, food in my kids bellies. You know what it is, though, how to balance a checkbook, how to understand profits and losses, how to grow a business, how to market and make money and monetize your Instagram, your Facebook, your YouTube, build a podcast, sales skills, um, growth strategies, things like that. Self-esteem, respect for women, respect for yourself, how to make sure that you take care of generations to come. You know, what to expect when building your business, what to expect uh, when people are telling you to go to college and you're telling them, no, I'd rather take a loan and build my business. Those are the reasons why I started Black Boys Win, because those are the things that we teach at Black Boys Win. And we operate strictly off of, of donations and the kindness of people who, who believe in the power of Black Boys becoming Black men and who are thriving in society. So BlackBoysWin.com, if you want to check that out or donate everything is always appreciated i'll make sure this uh this weekend i contribute to the uh black boys wins um ministries appreciate it <laughs> no problem all right everybody uh till next time brother anderson once again thank you for joining us peace